Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing groups of order p squared. Okay, so we've now proven the prerequisite theorem, which was that if you've got an arbitrary p group, that the center of that arbitrary p group is non trivial. It's not equal to the uh, trivial subgroup, it's always got order greater than 1. Okay, so what we're now going to do is return back just to talking about groups of order p squared. And what I want to prove next is that if you've got a group of order p squared, then it is an abelian group using the prerequisite theorem that we've just proven. Okay, so we'll call this uh, theorem 2. Okay, so theorem 2 is that if we've got a group uh, that I will still refer to as capital P here, because after all, this is still a P group, okay, uh, which has order P squared, okay, then the claim is that this group is going to be an abelian group, i.e. the centre of the group is going to be the entire group, and every element of the group is going to commute with every other element of the group. Okay, so the claim is that P is an abelian group. Okay, so how are we going to prove this then? Well, we're going to use the prerequisite theorem that we've shown that works certainly for groups of order p squared, uh, because it works for all p groups, uh, and we're going to do it by proof by contradiction. Okay, right, so what we're going to assume then is that p is not abelian, so p is non-abelian, and we're going to arrive at a contradiction. So P is non-abelian will be our starting assumption, and we'll arrive at a contradiction. And in fact, the contradiction we're going to arrive at is that P actually is abelian. So by assuming that P is non-abelian, we will manage to assume that P. We will ma sorry. We will manage to prove that P is abelian, and therefore clearly it's a contradiction. Okay, right. Uh, so how are we going to do this? So. We're going to use the prerequisite theorem, so we must be doing something to do with the centre of the group. So if we're making the assumption that P is non-abelian, then we know that the centre of the group is not equal to the entire group. That's part of that assumption. Okay, so the centre of the group is not equal to the entire group. Now remember, the centre of the group is always a subgroup of the group. Now, by the Grange's theorem, the order of a subgroup must divide the order of the group. The order of the group is p squared here. That means that the order of the centre of the group has only two options. Uh, well, uh, three options, rather. It has the option of being 1, it has the option of being p, or it has the option of being p squared, because those are the only things which divide the order of this group. Okay, it cannot be equal to 1 by the prerequisite theorem, and it is not equal to p squared because of our assumption that p is non-abelian, so it's not equal to the entire group. Therefore, we must conclude that the order of the centre of the group is just equal to p, this prime number. Okay, right, we are going to now use this to arrive uh, at the contradiction that p is indeed abelian. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, the first thing that I need to point out is that the centre of the group, as well as just being a subgroup of the initial group, is actually always a normal subgroup of the initial group. Okay, now why is that? Well, remember, uh, when we were proving the um, prerequisite theorem, we showed that if you conjugate any element of the centre of the group by any element of the larger group, then it does nothing, it fixes that element of the group because the element of the group commutes with any other, el sorry, the element of the centre of the group commutes with any other element of the group. So if you consider what g, z, g inverse is, where z is an element of the centre of the group and g is an element of the larger group, you can just swap g and z around here because z is an element of the centre of the group and therefore clearly the g and the g inverse will cancel. So this will go just give you the element of the centre of the group back again. So if you conjugate this entire subgroup, which is the centre of the group, by any element of the group, of course it's not going to change it, because it's not going to change any of the elements inside it even. Okay, All of the elements inside this will be fixed by conjugation. Okay, uh, So indeed, the centre of the group is always going to be a normal subgroup of the uh, larger group. Uh, now, what does that mean? That means that we can quotient our larger group out by the centre of the group. So what I'm now going to do is quotient P by the centre of the group. 
Now, how big is this quotient group that I end up with going to actually be? Well, of course, it's just going to be the index of the center of the group in the uh, group capital P, the number of left cosets of the center of the group. Now, the entire group has order P squared. The center of the group has order P, so just divide P squared by P because all of the cosets of the center of the group will have the same size as the center of the group. And of course, you'll end up with the order of this being equal to P. Okay, now what does that mean I can conclude about the quotient group that I've formed here? Well, if it's got order a prime number, then I can instantly conclude that it's isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of P elements. Okay, so P quotiented out by the centre of P, therefore, is going to be isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of P elements. And that is going to be the key to now showing that this group uh, is in fact abelian, that P originally was abelian. Okay, right, so uh, it's best now for me to draw a picture of this. Uh, so let's draw a picture of P being quotiented out by the centre of the group. So let's have this box representing P here, and let's have this down here, this thin little strip representing the centre of the group. So I'll just colour it in. So here is my entire uh, group, capital P, the group of order P squared. And now here I have the centre of my group, this thin green strip here. And now what I've done is I've quotiented P up into the cosets of the centre of P, and I need to make sure that I end up with a prime number of them, and 5 looks like my best hope here, so I'll aim for 5. Okay, so there we have a 5 of them, which is indeed a prime number. More generally, you'll have uh, P lots of these uh, cosets here. Okay, so there'll be P cosets, and therefore the order of the centre of the group will be this uh, prime number. Okay, right, and now what we know is that in fact this is a cyclic group on the set of P elements. It's isomorphic to the cyclic group on the set of P elements. Now, remember what that means. This group is very, very interesting, very, very easy to work with, and the reason is that all of the elements must have order either equal to 1 or P. Okay, so when you generate the cyclic subgroup generated by any element, if you're the identity element, and of course the identity element will be this green coset here, the actual centre of the group will contain the identity element from the original group, so this will become the identity in the quotient group. Okay. Uh, if you're the identity element in a cyclic group on the set of P elements, then of course if you generate its cyclic subgroup, then you just form the trivial subgroup, so its order is equal to 1. But all the other non-identity elements, when you generate their cyclic subgroups, you must end up with the entire group back again, so they must have order P. So what that tells us is that any non-identity coset here, okay, any of these other cosets in white here, uh, is going to generate the entire quotient group. Okay, uh, So we can just take powers of it to generate the entire quotient group. So let's take, for instance, this coset here. Let's say it contains an element which I'll call x here, so we can call it x bar. So all of the other cosets here must just be powers of x. So this one can be x bar squared, uh, this one can be x bar cubed, and all the way up more generally to x bar to the power of p minus 1. But think about this further. How do you actually construct x bar squared? You take a representative from x and you square it according to the composition law in the initial group. Okay, so we might as well take the representative x here. So x bar squared is actually going to contain x squared. x bar cubed will actually contain x cubed. x bar to the power of p minus 1 will actually contain x to the power of p minus 1. Okay, so this means I can characterize these other cosets here by powers of x, and if you like, you can think of this one as containing x to the power of 0, which is the identity element here. Okay, so I can characterize all of these cosets here by these powers of x. Now, it gets even better than that, uh, because I'm, I've now characterized the cosets. What, of course, I want to do is characterize the entire group, capital P. I want to prove that P is abelian. So, let me firstly characterize all the elements of P. I've got a representative from every single coset now. I want to look for all the other elements of the cosets. How can I do that? Well, of course, all the elements of the cosets are just one element of the coset times all the elements of the uh, thing that we quotiented out by. Okay. So, in fact, if you've got an arbitrary A, which is an element of capital P, 
A is going to be in one of these cosets, there's going to be a power of x, so x to the power of i, where i is equal to 0, 1, all the way up to p minus 1, times some element of the center, because these are, after all, all just cosets of the center. So the way that you construct the left, the, well, either left coset, we're doing left coset here, so we'll stick to left coset. Uh, of course, left cosets and right cosets are exactly the same when we're talking about normal subgroups, so it doesn't matter, okay? But the way that I construct this left coset of the center of the group under x squared, let's say, is I just multiply x squared with all the elements of the center of the group. Okay, so any element of the group will be in one of these cosets. You just take the power of x uh, that uh, it's in the same coset as, and then it's just that times some element of the center. So z, little z here is an element of the center of p. Okay, so here, then, is my characterization of the, all the elements of my entire group, capital P here. They are all just powers of x times some element of the center. Excellent. Now let me prove that P is actually abelian from this. Okay, so what I want to prove it, is that if I take A and B, which are arbitrary elements of capital P, okay, I want to prove that A times B is equal to B times A. And if I can do that, then I've proven that it's abelian. Okay, which is a contradiction, and hence the center of the group must have equaled the entire group. Uh, so it must have been obedient. Okay, right. Uh, so um, how can I do this? Well, I can write a and b in this form. So a is going to be some power of x, x to the power of i, times, let's say, z1, and b is going to be some power of x, x to the power of j, times z2. Now just work these things out. Let's firstly work out a times b. So a times b will be x to the power of i times z1, times x to the power of j times z2, or composed if you prefer to times, uh, whatever you want to call it, I'm just saying times for the composition here, uh, but if you want to, if you prefer to keep this very abstract, then call it composition. Okay, now because it's, of course, group theory that we're doing here, we know that associativity works, so that's why I haven't bothered to put any brackets in. Now, what I can do is apply the fact that z1 and z2 are elements of the center here, okay, and therefore they commute with all the other elements of the group. So in particular, z1 will commute with x to the power of j here. So I can turn this into x to the power of i times x to the power of j times z1 composed with z2 here. And then I can combine x to the power of i with x to the power of j here, because this just means compose x with itself i times. This just means compose x with itself j times. So this is just equivalent to x uh, composed with itself i plus j times, composed with z1, composed with z2 here. Okay, so that's the answer to the left-hand side. Now let's work out the answer to the right-hand side here. So ba would be x to the j uh, z2 composed with x to the i z1. And again, I haven't bothered putting in brackets because I know associativity works in a group. Okay. Now, of course, what I can do is apply again the fact that elements of the center commute with all other elements of the group. So this time, commute z2 and x to the i here, and you'll get x to the j, x to the i, z2, z1. Z1 and Z2 will commute with each other because they're both elements of the center, so I'll swap them around. And of course, here I've got X composed with itself J times, composed with X composed with itself I times. Again, that's just X composed with itself I plus J times. Okay, so truly I've turned uh, the right-hand side into the same thing as I turned the left-hand side into, so truly they are equal to one another, and therefore I have proven a contradiction because I've now proven that P is abelian, even though we assumed that the center of the group was not equal to the entire group, and therefore P was not abelian. So that's a contradiction, so we must have the only other option, which is that the center of our group of order P squared is actually equal to the entire group, i.e. if you have a group of order P squared, it is an abelian group, it is a commutative group, all compositions are commutative. Okay, and we will use that fact in the next video uh, to finally prove uh, this characterization theorem uh, that there are only two isomorphism classes of groups of order p squared.